Okay, now we move on to chapter 3, which is multivariate regression, or Woodridge prefers to call it uh, multiple linear regression, or MLR. And again, I will focus more on the study guide, okay, and then I will briefly go through the slides, actually. And then this is how the multiple linear regression looks like, y as a function of at least two explanatory variables. So in this one, you see x1, x2, up to xk, okay? Okay, so again, same regression function, and then I think as I argued in the last chapter, in reality, it is unlikely for us to run a simple linear regression or bivariate regression because we, it, it assumes only one explanatory variable would have an impact on the variation of y, y, or all other factors affecting y are uncorrelated. With the x, it means they are hiding in the disturbance terms. But remember that wage regression with the IQ and years of work experience, they are hiding as part of the disturbance terms or error terms. And then we don't think the mean of IQ and mean of years of work experience are constant at different x values. So at the end, by running the bivariate regression, wage as a function of x, which is years of education, we actually commit specification bias, which means underfitting. Okay, causing x years of education to be correlated with the error terms u, which contains the omitted explanatory variables, IQ and years of work experience. Okay, uh, so we later decided that we would rather run the multiple linear regression model or multivariate regression. Okay, if we add more factors or explanatory variables that are valid, relevant, useful for explaining why then more of the variation in y can be explained by a series of uh, explanatory variables. Okay, therefore the multiple regression analysis can build better models for prediction and forecasting. And then degrees of freedom is still the same, a minus k minus one. Okay, one would be the number of constant, keep that in mind. Yeah, this is just a reminder. This is from the last chapter. Simple linear regression model, wage as a function of years, years of education, but assuming IQ and years of work experience, which are hiding in the error terms, are uncorrelated with education year. But it is wrong, actually. Therefore, we rather run it as a multiple linear regression model, wage as a function of education years, IQ, <coughs> And experience, years of work experience. In other words, IQ and years of work experience are taken out of the error terms from the simple linear regression and are put explicitly as explanatory variables in the multiple linear regression. Okay, but now we will face a dilemma actually. What if now x1, x2, x3, which means education, year, IQ, and experience are too strongly correlated, it could lead to another problem called imperfect collinearity or imperfect multicollinearity. I wonder if you still remember that, meaning strong linear relationship between explanatory variables. And actually, if imperfect uh, multicollinearity or imperfect collinearity happens, there will be some bad consequences. Remember, you learn in ECO 311, and one of the main consequences is that it causes the standard error of the parameter or the variance of the parameter to increase, okay, to go up, actually. So in other words, you're facing a dilemma. If I run it as a multivariate regression model, I stand the risk of suffering the problem of imperfect collinearity or imperfect multicollinearity. Okay, but if I insist to run it as a uh, simple linear regression model, then I would have I would experience suffer another problem, which is the x, which is years of education here, and the error terms are too strongly correlated. And remember, if x and the error terms are strongly correlated, then the uh, then this important condition that the mean of the error term is constant or equal to zero at all x values would not hold. Okay. Okay, and then I think the first seven slides, yeah, I think that will be fine. You can go through these examples. Okay, this one, if consumption is explained by income and income square, then it is also counted as multivariate regression because income and income square are not exactly the same. Okay, so we count it as two explanatory variables. So it is regarded as a multivariate regression. So keep that in mind.
And then we can also take log. Okay, you are allowed to run it as log lean, lean log, and so forth, providing there are at least two explanatory variables. Then it is a multiple linear regression model. Actually, it is not linear. In this case, you see the square of uh, CEO salary <laughs> explaining my salary. Yeah. Okay. And then we can move on to the next part. Again, the uh, before we talk about the properties of OLS. Uh, estimators we first learn about the interpretation okay you already learned it in eco 311 the only import the only difference when it comes to interpretation is that you have to talk about the sectors paribus condition so this is an example i think i can zoom that out okay this one multivariate regression marks explained by study hours and party hours this is actually an example from your eco 311 last year. Constant means what happens to y hat when all the x's are zero. So b zero hat, how can we interpret 55 point something? It means when my study r is zero and party r is zero. The sample regression function predicts that on average final mark is 55 something. Gosh, I'm sending a dangerous message that you don't study. You are going to pass okay with more than 50%. So I think I need to change the parameter actually. Maybe in future I must make it I must make the constant parameter less than 50. Okay, the first slope parameter x uh, b1 hat in connection with x1 study r 6.1271. The interpretation is if x1 study r increases by one unit, then the setters paribus condition, providing there's no change in your other explanatory variable, which is x2 or your party r, then the sample regression function will predict that on average final mark would increase by 6.1271 of course increase because of the positive sign here and then the next slope parameter b2 hat in connection with x2 party out you already see the negative sign here so the interpretation of b2 hat is if x2 party out increases by one unit providing there's no change in your other explanatory variable x1 no change in study hours, then the sample regression function predicts that on average, uh, part uh, final mark would decrease by uh, three point something, three point oh oh four one units. It makes sense because of the negative relationship. Okay, the more time I spend partying, then how would I have time to perform well as a student? Okay, and then the last tricky case is what if both x1 and x2 increase by one unit at the same time? Then the interpretation is you simply add the two slope parameters together. Okay, and then you end up having three point something, meaning if both study hours and party hours increase by one unit, the sample regression function predicts that on average final mark would increase by 3.1 something units. Okay, and then the properties of the OLS statistics. Okay, you already, it, it is actually more or less the same three properties you learned from the last chapter, simple linear regression. Again, sum and mean of residuals are zero. Remember I mentioned in the last uh, chapter, we want the residuals to have a random distribution, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Okay, then the mean would be zero. No relationship between x's, all the x's and the residuals, and then the sample mean, all the sample mean of x, x1 bar, x2 bar, xk bar, and the sample mean of y, y bar lie on the regression line. Okay, and then I mentioned in the last chapter about the one weird characteristics of r square. Okay, therefore, if we want to uh, compare the goodness of fit of two regressions or even more than two regressions with different number of explanatory variables adjusted r square is the better indicator okay and you're going to learn more about adjusted r square and apply it interpret it calculate it in the honors econometrics module although you more or less learn about the adjusted r square in uh, eco 311 okay and then the uh, assumptions of the multiple linear regression model six assumptions Okay, more or less the same as in the previous chapter, simple linear regression. The first one, the first assumption is still exactly the same, linear in parameters. I'm not going to explain it again, so let me give you 15 seconds to read through the first bullet.
okay? Second one, random sampling quite easy. I'm also not going to explain it again, so I stop for 10 seconds for you to go through it. Okay, then I want to jump to the fourth and the fifth assumption. Again, same old story as the previous chapter. So I will stop for half a minute for you to refresh your memory. Please go through these two bullets. Okay, the sixth one, it actually comes, it will only appear in the next chapter, but it is actually quite an easy assumption. Error terms are normally distributed with a mean of zero and variance of, uh, is it called sigma, sigma square? I hope it is called sigma actually. Okay. Okay, just like the residuals, we want error terms to have a no random normal distribution, sometimes negative, sometimes positive, so that the mean is zero. And this is the variance. And then the third one, we have to change it a little bit, okay? Remember in the previous chapter, simple linear regression model, the third assumption is that uh, the x value from the sample collector cannot be exactly the same. Otherwise, we will have a vertical line, which is strictly speaking, not a regression line. And then for this chapter, multiple linear regression model, we change the, this assumption a little bit. The first part still implies that the x value cannot be exactly the same, cannot be constant, but we rather focus on the perfect collinearity, okay, or perfect multicollinearity. It means there is no exact linear relationship between the explanatory variables. Otherwise, game over to your regression. So I have three examples here. The first one, noise level explained by x1 number of people and number of fingers. Don't you think if I have one person, then 10 fingers, two persons, 20 fingers, and so forth. So actually, x2, the number of fingers, is exactly equal to 10 times x1, 10 times the number of people. So if I include both as explanatory variable, then you will get an error message on eViews or starter. It is impossible to derive the regression output. Next example, marks explained by lecture attendance, it seems fine, but then study hours and study minutes, they are there is an exact linear relationship between the two variables because one hour stands for 60 minutes, two hours stands for 120 minutes, three hours stands for 180 minutes, and so forth. The last one, selling price of a property is a function of number of rooms, number of garages, number of sleeping rooms, number of study rooms, and size of the garden. And we found that the number of all rooms is exactly equal to the number of sleeping rooms plus the number of study rooms. So this x1 is exactly equal to x3 plus x4. Okay, and then after I run the regression as multiple linear regression model, if luckily the axis, the explanatory variables are uncorrelated with the error terms, then good. Then the explanatory variables, we call them as exogenous explanatory variables. But if unfortunately, even after running the regression as multiple linear regression model, the explanatory variables are still correlated with the error terms, then the axis, we will call them as endogenous explanatory variables. So in other words, this condition mean of error term equals zero at each x assumption would no longer hold. In other words, there is still something wrong with the regression. Maybe I still commit underfitting and so forth, or maybe I even use the wrong functional form. Okay. Okay.
And then in the next video, we will talk about, we will mainly focus on underfitting, the impact of committing underfitting on possible bias on the slope parameter.